One of the great privileges of the faith is the fellowship that we enjoy with others who uh, have like commitments, not only doctrinally, but uh, in the passion of sharing Christ and missions, education. That is very true this morning. Our speaker is Dr. Joe Jordan, who is the executive director of Word of Life Fellowship in Incorporated and International. He came to know Christ as Savior through the influence of a Christian businessman who sent Joe to camp at Word of Life Island in 1961. At that time, God changed the life of a troubled teenager into a young man with a burning desire to reach others. Joe Jordan became full-time missionary with Word of Life and left for Argentina in 1969, where he founded Word of Life's ministry there and directed it for some 20 years. God blessed and expanded the work in Argentina to include a Bible institute, Christian camps, and clubs throughout the country. From Argentina and the training through the Bible Institute, missionaries have been sent out to almost every Spanish-speaking country in Central and South America, as well as Italy, Spain, Romania, the Ukraine, and Portugal. After serving as for five years as Senior Vice President of Ministries, Dr. Jordan was appointed the Director of Word of Life Fellowship International, and then in 1999, he was made Executive Director of the Worldwide Ministries of Word of Life. Uh, Joe has a great passion for Christ. He's a good friend. Many on our faculty have had uh, ministry with Word of Life around the world, and some of you who sit before us today are the product of the Word of Life ministry. We're deeply grateful for their faithfulness over these years and how God has blessed them around the world. Would you welcome a dear friend, Dr. Joe Jordan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bailey, and it's a joy to be right here at Dallas Theological Seminary. And so many wonderful, wonderful friends, men of God from the Word of God, and what a, what a blessing it is to be with you. I brought a few materials and I'd just like to mention them and uh, some of them are down below. This is a book that has been translated from Spanish to English. Usually you have from English to Spanish, but this is Spanish to English. It's called Crossing the Valley. It's a biography of a young man who came to Christ in our ministry, studying our Bible Institute, and then was martyred at the hands of the guerrillas in Colombia, Ramon Rivas, a great, uh, great young man, servant of Christ, and I just have a couple of copies. If you'd like one, you can have one. Um, also, many of your professors uh, come right toward life. For instance, this summer, we'll be having Dr. Howard Hendricks, Dr. Stanley Toussaint, Dr. Ron Blue, and Dr. Mark Bailey, among many others. So they come and fellowship with us in the Word of God. We're excited about that. We have a few camp brochures. We have some 2,000 students studying the Word of God with us here in the States and around the world. And we just brought a few brochures to the Word Life Bible Institute. You might like to browse through that. And we're looking for young men who are gifted in the Word of God, teaching the Word of God in many of these places. And we have visiting lectures, and many of your professors here come and teach with us. Also, we have a program in the local churches around America and around the world, local church ministries where we teach young people doctrine. We believe young people can not only hear but understand and appreciate Bible doctrine. In a six-year program, they go through the basic doctrines of Scripture and also create holy habits. We're like quiet time diary where they write uh, their own commentary of Scripture through a six-year program going through Scripture. Bible memorization. We have approximately some 60,000 young people meeting every week studying the scriptures. And it's a joy to see that happening here and around the world. And then our camping ministry, some 75,000 young people come to our camps and we have a few brochures on that and you're free to pick them up. 
This morning, for a few minutes, I want to share with you not just a message, but what I would consider the passion of my life is all about. You know, as you focus in on life and ministry, it's important to check out what is the passion of your life, what you're given to. A.B. Bruce, in his uh, very classic work, The Training of the Twelve, wrote words like this, The Lord Jesus cast his nets into the sea of humanity and brought to the shores of eternity a great harvest of souls. Yet he would build his program upon the deep bedrock commitment of a few, not on the shifting sin of the convenience of many. How important it is to focus in on the whole aspect of ministry. This morning, if you ask for a title, it would probably be something like this, a ministry that goes beyond the grave. What will you leave behind? We hear a lot about legacy. Well, I want to just share with you about the whole concept of ministry in life. Take your copy of the scriptures and turn with me, please, to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We'll be starting there. And here the Apostle Paul, writing to the believers there at Thessalonica, the second church founded in Europe, would say this in verse 1, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. Go back into verse 9, he says, of chapter 1. Again, he uses this word entering. The whole concept of a coming in, the whole concept of of an entering in. Maybe I could just say it like this. He said our connection with you was not empty, it was not vain. It had lasting results. Well, what would those lasting results be all about? The ministry of the Apostle Paul, we know, would go and it would be used to raise up many churches. But his life was not about mortar. His life was about men. It was about fleshing out truth in the lives of men. How to have a ministry that goes beyond the grave. Notice in verse 2, he references even a ministry previous to that in Philippi. How he had suffered before and been shamefully entreated. Interesting word, one, one single word. A word that brings with it the idea of insult. A word that has the concept of being put down. And there, after suffering and after being put down... He comes to the place that he says, God has done something wonderful. And he said, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. There was a great battle, great conflict. As you know around the world, the tremendous conflict of carrying forth the truth of Christ. How would Paul have this ministry that would go beyond the grave? Well, if you look a little bit before in chapter 1, he gives us a clue. He says this, notice verse 6, And ye became followers of us, imitators, mimics. I like the little word mime. It's that same concept. He said, you saw us. You became like imitators of us and of the Lord, mimes. Notice also in verse 7, they were not only that, but they became models, examples. Good word there, model. And they were mimicking, they were imitating the Lord and the Apostle Paul. And they became models. And then in verse 8, they became mouths because from them sounded out, reverberated. Interesting term, I think, a chaplain bill. It's like the strong sound of a trumpet going forth, shaking, and they knew that the message had been conveyed. Here is the Apostle Paul. How would he do it? Well, I'd ask you just to turn with me to the second epistle that he wrote to young Timothy. Very challenging, challenging word here. In verse 10, he's speaking to young Timothy, and he says, but you have fully known, interesting term, you, you, have, you have attached yourself to me. You've traced yourself. 
It's a whole concept of putting one life on top of another life and following a definite pattern. This, uh, this same word is found in 1 Timothy chapter 4. In verse 6, the same word said, a little bit different in the English, but it's the same concept. In the last words of verse 6, whereunto you have attained, or you traced out, you, you followed closely is the idea. Following hard, following closely. It's interesting that Dr. Luke used this same expression over in Luke chapter 1, where he really has the concept of investigating. And there in verse 3, seemed good to me also having had perfect understanding, that term there, having investigated fully. And here's the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy and to others. And he's saying this, I laid my life down and you placed your life on top of it and you traced it out in such a way that you too became models. How would that happen? Well, just a few concepts for you that I think are very, very important. It happened because of his message, of his preaching, of his message. Back in this text of 1 Thessalonians, he would say it like this in verse 5, our gospel of chapter 1. Then he used that same phrase in chapter 2, verse 2, the gospel of God. And he would use it again and again. Verse 4, the gospel. Verse 8, the gospel. Verse 9, the gospel. What he's trying to communicate here is that his message was so clear, so convicting, that the Spirit of God used it to touch lives. Much has been debated about the gospel. It's interesting. Paul declared it, and he made it very, very clear. You know what something is by what it contains or the contents, but also the characteristics. And we know that a very clear biblical definition of that is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And you can read it right there in the first verses of this whole aspect of the gospel which he preached. Verse 3 of chapter 15, I deliver unto you that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he rose again the third day. And I would just share with you, just in a concise way, that his message of the gospel was Bible-based according to the scriptures. If you would go to the book of Acts, you would see how aptly he would quote from the Old Testament scriptures. He would go to the synagogues and his message was clearly founded upon the scriptures. Bible-based message. It was Dr. Lewis Berry Chafer, the founder of this seminary, that would tell his students as they would go out on the weekends, gentlemen, go out there and give those people something to believe in. And that's what it's all about. Go out there and give them something to believe in. The Bible-based message, but also it was Christ-centered. It was about Jesus Christ. He would go and he would convince that this one, Jesus, was truly the Christ. He would preach Christ. And as he did that, he would draw people to the person of Christ. The Bible-based, Christ-centered. Now watch this. It was a sin-denouncing message. We know that the word gospel means good news. But I often tell my students there's no good news until there's bad news. People have got to see the very truth of their sin. And we know the Holy Spirit of God takes the Scriptures and He convicts of sin and there's no conversion until there's conviction. And you can see how upfront the Apostle Paul was in his preaching and he not only preached about sin in a general way, but he would pinpoint that sin. And the Spirit of God would take that ascend denouncing message. But what I love about his preaching, it was not just a Bible-based and Christ-centered and sin denouncing, but it was a victory-producing message. Always at the center of his message 
would be the truth of the resurrection. I would challenge you sometime just to go through the preaching of the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts and see how he focuses in on the resurrection, the resurrection, the resurrection. In fact, I believe the central, one of the central themes of the book of Acts is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the contents. What about the characteristics of the message he would preach? Well, you can see it by different adjectives throughout the New Testament. For instance, it's called the gospel of the grace of God in Acts chapter 20, verse 24. Good news, good news. God has, and I like this word for it, a provision for you. That provision is God's grace. Now watch this. It's the gospel of the grace of God. Then in Romans 1, 9, it's the gospel of his son, of his son. We see that son is the Christ in Romans 1, 16. And then I love this in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the gospel of glory. Come and glorify God by believing in Jesus Christ. The first step someone takes to glorify God is that step of belief in Christ. And it brings glory to God. I think that would revolutionize our evangelism. If we would evangelize for the glory of God and lift him up, then we see that that gospel is called, and I love this one, in Colossians 1.23, the gospel of hope. Hope. This past week, I had the privilege of going to Angola, the largest state penitentiary, maximum security in the United States, 5,000 inmates. We were there sharing the gospel with them. It's interesting to note that there are five churches built on that complex. They're building the sixth. And they're in the different camps. And the inmates come. Now the average sentence is 88.7 years. They're in there for murder, rape, aggravated rape. They're lifers. But to share with them the gospel. But the gospel of hope. There's a hope for them beyond their sin in the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection to give them new life. Well, we did a production there. We took a whole team. It's built on the life story of two young people from Argentina who were on the drug scene. They were street kids. They both contracted the AIDS virus. But they came to Christ before. They came to study at the Word of Life Bible Institute. In their last two years of life, they would visit the AIDS hospitals. And they came to me and they said, after we die, we want to we leave something. Is it possible to write up our life story in a musical drama? We did that. It's been seen by well over half a million young people called Born Again to a Living Hope. We did that. We saw hundreds of inmates place their trust in Christ. It's moving. But it's moving also to go to the individual cells. And I don't know if you've ever had this experience, walking down death row and looking through the bars of someone facing death and telling them there's hope. I was there, I spoke to, the last time I was there, a man by the name of Miguel Velez, a hip man from Pablo Escobar. And um, it's hard to think that someone like that could come to Christ, but he did. I gave him Bible study books. What a wonderful time. And I was going to visit him again, and uh, the warden said, you need to visit another guy. I said, who's that warden? He said, um, well, you need to visit a David Carr. Now, the only David Carr I ever heard about was quarterback in Houston. But this is another guy. He's in for life, for murder. Only one to ever escape from this prison. To go to a dungeon, he was in the dungeon, and look across those bars and share with him the gospel of hope. I want to tell you something exciting. But that's what he said, the gospel of hope. Then another name is uh, the gospel of God. We see it right here. 
It's God's message. I come to you today in the authority of God. It's His gospel. It belongs to Him. I do not have the authority to change it, to alter it. I must preach it just like it is. It's the gospel of God. Ephesians 1.13 It's the gospel of your salvation. Ephesians 6.15 The gospel of peace. Romans 1.16 The gospel of power. He came with the right message. And I would just say to you, that is the message that brings forth a transforming work in the lives of people. But he not only did that with the right message, and we could talk about that in his preaching, but what about his practice? How did he carry it out? His methodology, if you will. Verse 3 says, for our exhortation was not of deceit. Interesting term that deceit is not of deceit he says we're not trying to meander around is the idea to lead you astray nor of uncleanliness nor in guile to bait you to catch you we didn't come to you like that in verse 5 for neither at any time use we flattering words his practice, his methodology was as biblical as his message. And I would just say to you that God never would have us to carry forth the ministry on the new cart of the Philistines but on the shoulders of holy men and women of God who would go forth in their methodology. There was no insincerity, no impurity, and no inconsistency in his methodology. But perhaps it was because deep down in his soul he was committed to what we might say is his motivating factor. What was that? To glorify God. His motive? Notice verse 6. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you. Back in verse 4 he says, We were not seeking to please men, but God which trieth our hearts. I like that. I love that portion right before we read about the Bema seat in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, but verse 9. Because there Paul says, I am ambitious. The first time I saw that, I said, man, how can a man like this be ambitious? He said, but I am ambitious. What's your ambition, Paul? To please God. To hear that, well done, thy good and faithful servant. And I would say that would purify all of us if our motives were like that. Whether we preach before few or for multitudes, before cameras are in death row, it's to please God, not men. But then, how would he carry it out? What would his manner be? This is what I love. Look at verse Seven, but we were gentle among you, like a child. And as a nurse, a good phrase there, a nursing mother. As a nursing mother would draw a babe to her breast, we were tender among you. It's interesting, that isn't it? That uh, the Lord doesn't say, drive my cattle, but leave my sheep. And that tender care, that loving tender care. And notice, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but our own souls, because you were dear unto us. Now let me just say this to you. Ministry is more than exegeting a passage. It's expounding a life being dear. And he said, you knew we loved you. We poured out our own soul to you. And why did you do that? Well, because his whole purpose, his mark, what he was heading to, look in verse 12, that you would walk worthy of God who hath called you into his kingdom and glory. 
He said, uh, our mark, our purpose is that you'd be able to walk worthy of God. Just like he wrote to the church at Colossae in Colossians 1. Speaking of Christ whom we preach, warning every man that face-to-face confrontation, teaching every man, being able to expound the truth to every man in all wisdom. And here it is, that we might present every man mature in Christ Jesus. It's like this. One day I want to present you mature in Christ Jesus. And this whole ministry of multiplication is that concept of impregnating their hearts and minds and souls with the very life of Christ. It's being vulnerable. It's laying your life out in such a way following Christ. They lay their life upon yours. In doing that, they follow Christ. Bringing maturity to that. I've had the privilege of ministering in several countries around the world and seeing some of God's work and seeing what God does. And I have a passion in my heart. Could I just say it like this, to be a bridge. Be a bridge from a past generation that God's used to bless my life to a future generation. To be able to see this reproduction, just like Dawson Trotman said, born to reproduce. What's that all about? How do you do that? Several years ago, we took our kids, and they were just young. We'd tell them stories of great men of God, and the story of D.L. Moody, and we were in Massachusetts. And I said, I'm going to take you to Northfield, where D.L. Moody was born. We arrived there, and we drove in Northfield, and we saw some young people walking along, about the age of some of you, and I said, uh, can you tell me where D.L. Moody's birth house is? They looked at me and said, who? I said, D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody. Well, we really haven't heard. You might want to go to the office. We went to the office, and a young lady in her 30s was there, and I said, can you tell me where D.L. Moody was born, his birth house? She said, I really don't know, but if you'll go two blocks down and turn to the right, there's a little house there, and an older lady, and she'll be able to tell you, and we did so, and she directed us to the house. No one was there. I walked in, saw the pulpit he preached from, picked up a Bible given to D.L. Moody by Charles Haddon Spurgeon. No one was there. I could have walked out with that Bible. I was tempted to. I didn't. (laughs) I have a collection of Bibles. But uh, then uh, we walked out to a little knoll, saw their gravesite. Read this verse, the world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. My daughter said, Daddy, why didn't they know D.L. Moody? Why didn't they know D.L. Moody? Wasn't passed on. We left Argentina after 20 years. We went there just as a couple. We didn't know anyone in the country. The hardest thing we ever did. But when we left... We left not only a staff there, but in some 22 different countries. A people we had the privilege of winning to Christ and placing our lives on top of their lives and moving out. The airport was packed. When we left, they broke out hearts and started to sing, God be with you. And someone put an Argentine flag around my neck, and I went up and I was weeping. Our plane stopped in one place, and it was in Rio de Janeiro. And I got off the plane, and I said, Honey, I got to read something. So I got a newspaper. And a very well dressed businessman was standing there just staring at me. I don't know if you ever had that experience, but finally he said, I got to ask you a question. I said, Go ahead. He said, What'd you do to those people? I said, What are you talking about? He said, The whole airport was crying. What'd you do to those people? I said, I didn't do anything, but I can tell you who he did. His name is Jesus. And I shared with him the gospel, and then he took a, a card out of his pocket and he handed it to me. He said, Sir, I work with Rockefeller, and we move millions of dollars around the, billions of dollars around the world. But you truly are a rich man. With that, he turned around and walked away. I got back on that plane, and I understood the riches in life is not about mortar, it's about men. 
that you leave a stamp on, and the stamp is the image of Christ. You walk away, and people will know that Christ is real and near. Father, I would pray that you'll help us all to see and understand that ministry is about not just building buildings, but building men and women for the glory of God. This I pray in Jesus' name, amen.